Hi everyone, and welcome to part two of three different lectures that are going to examine various theoretical perspectives and their sort of connection to domestic violence. Um, in our first lecture, we talked about biological and psychological factors. Um, as we move into part two, we're going to look at some areas that are related to sociological theories. And one of the things that you're going to notice as we go through a brief discussion of various uh, theoretical perspectives, as well as components of different theories, is sort of the continual look at sort of the integrated or overlapping nature of many of these theories. So when you come back to your notes and you're thinking, okay, which theory do I focus on? In the realm of domestic violence and trying to understand any particular incident or situation involving domestic violence, rarely is there going to be one theory or one theoretical perspective that explains everything. So I want you to always remember that. The best approach is usually it's an integration of various components. And as we go through and talk about various sociological factors, you're going to see connections to, aha, oh, that reminds me of things that we spoke about when we talked about psychology with fear and anxiety levels um, or other biological or psychological factors. So in this particular lecture, we are going to focus, I've sort of broken it up into the, the family components. Um, so we're going to talk about sociological factors within the family that have shown connections to domestic violence. Um, and as you can see here in dark blue, sort of the three ways that I've sort of categorized those are one, the exchange slash social control theory. Um, and then we're going to move on to just what we've sort of drawn from not any one particular family-based theory, but what are sort of the overall findings that we're getting from family-based theories. And we'll do the same idea when we think about learning components. What are some components of learning theories that contribute to our understanding of domestic violence? We'll then move on to looking at beyond, so not just like the micro look of within a family and the sociology within a family, but we'll look at more of a macro look. How um, the community in which a, a family is situated within, what are those larger macro sociological factors that can have an influence or play a role in domestic violence? And once again, I've broken it down into sort of three categories. One, we're going to talk about the role that economic disadvantage um, can play um, in, in sort of impacting domestic violence. Um, the role that traditional gender roles play in various cultures and societies. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about what happens when a family faces social isol isolation and how that can sort of contribute to potential increases in the likelihood or duration of domestic violence. The readings that correspond to this lecture are going to be to continue through chapter four of your course textbook. So let's go ahead and dive into this. So before we break into those sort of three categories of what I call the, the family-based sociological theories, let's kind of think about where, what, how sociologists approach sort of their explanations of domestic violence. So historically, sociologists have rejected purely psychological and even biological explanations for domestic violence. And this goes with what I had said earlier. There's a recognition that it's not, it's rarely is it purely biological or psychological factors that are going to impact a person's behavior in every situation. Rather, it is the environment that they're in that can therefore sort of exacerbate or mitigate certain biological and psychological underpinning factors. And so sociologists sort of look at a combination of multiple factors the role that larger social institutions may play in impacting families, um, the family structure, and you'll see some of that in the next couple slides. Um, they also do recognize that various psychological factors, levels of fear, anxiety, etc., can have a role on um, either an abuser or a victim. The interplay of a social situation along with psychology, we'll definitely see that in some of these um, coming slides. And then also when we think about culture, and remember one of the things we talked about earlier this semester is the central importance of really being able to wrap our minds around this idea of cultural competency, right? Because 
from one culture to the next, how we define what is socially acceptable or unacceptable changes. And we'll see how that has a role and interplays or intersects with domestic violence. So the first sort of family-based theory that we're going to briefly look at is referred to as sort of the exchange social control theory. And if you remember from your um, criminal um, justice theory course, some of these ideas you're going, oh, I recognize this from things about like, you know, social control in general, rational choice, things that nature. But this theory put out by Gels in 1983 really focuses and helps to shine a light on domestic violence. And one of our key takeaways without completely spending um, an hour and a half going through this one theory, let's hit the high point. What's the big takeaway for us? And that is that individuals who are prone to violence for whatever reason, whether it be biology, psychology, other social factors, but we start with that. Individuals who are prone to violence are more likely to carry out aggression in settings where, and here's the key thing, they are likely to escape repercussion. And you can imagine how this theory all of a sudden becomes a perfect opportunity for us to try to understand the role of domestic violence, especially since so much domestic violence occurs behind closed doors in the family setting, right? It's in the family home, the family apartment, in the, the family's car, where you're all sort of in a bubble. And we see this idea that if people are prone to carry out violence, if the perpetrator has that characteristic, well, then if they can do it behind closed doors where they're unlikely to have face any consequences, the likelihood of that violence will increase. So let's see how sort of three things where we see that that sort of the, that situation, that setting, that family setting may actually have um, a negative impact. One is we think about rational choice component, right? If you remember from most rational choice theories, the, I, the thought is that individuals engage in crime when they do sort of this mental calculus and come to the, the outcome or belief that the rewards for engaging in that criminal behavior are going to be greater than what they predict the cost to be. So if they think they can get away with the crime and they're not going to get caught, they're more likely to do it. Well, you can imagine how that translates perfectly into a domestic violence situation. If somebody already has an inclination towards violence, in their mental calculus, their mind almost makes it seem as a rational decision to inflict harm behind the closed doors of the family setting where there's less likely to be seen or heard or reported. And the reward in the minds of that perpetrator are to you know, have an outlet for their violence or to, you know, in many ways not to be crass, but to shut up or fix or, or change the behavior of the victim. Um, so that rational choice comes in, into play. Also, when we think about this, oftentimes people who are prone to violence, what are some other areas where they are likely to, or be able to show aggression and be able to escape repercussion? Well, there are socially acceptable outlets, right? There's certain types of sports where you can go out and vent your frustration, vent your anger, and sort of leave it on the field, but it's allowed in that particular situation. There are also certain types of jobs that require a lot of aggression and, you know, working and almost they're a workout in and of themselves where people can sort of sort of vent their aggression or vent their violence in a socially acceptable manner. Well, you can imagine if those outlets are unavailable to these individuals, you may find that they turn their violence outlet towards the home. And we'll talk also, we'll see some stories about, sadly, we'd see quite a few cases of professional athletes who are accused and or convicted of domestic violence. And we think, are these individuals who were drawn into their particular sport or their profession because they were able to have an outlet for their violence, an outlet for their aggression, but they don't know how to turn it off. And when they come home and they're back in that sort of that bubble of their family environment, they still have not learned how to tone down their outlets. Um, and then finally, we think about the role of power. Another place or another way in which an individual who is prone to violence 
can find a way to sort of act on it or act on their aggression is by having a lot of power. Um, once again, sadly, when we look at the headline making news cases, whether it's in, you know, Hollywood moguls and, and per, you know, producers and people with a lot of power in society, we hear stories of them behaving in very socially unacceptable ways. But for the most part, they get away with it because they have sort of economic or political power to either get people to look the other way or to sort of sweep it under the rug, and they're able to impose their own will. So various components of this exchange social control theory really give us a glimpse of how something like a psychological or biological factor that leads somebody to be prone to violence in the first place can all of a sudden, we think of the family environment as becoming a very ripe area for them to let their sort of their violence grow um, in a dangerous manner. On this slide, we're going to just sort of do a little wrap up and a couple takeaways from this exchange and social control theory. First, and I touched on this quite a bit on the last slide, is that argument that the home is a low risk environment for individuals who are naturally prone to violence. Why? Well, because that violence within the home can be hidden from public view. Um, and therefore, it makes the home a fertile ground for domestic violence. But also, we think about how various types of groups are, may be more likely to become abusers. And when you read this second bullet point down here where it says vulnerable groups, at first you may go, wait, is he talking about the victims or the abusers? And the short answer is yes. But under this theory, it's sort of focusing on how even the vulnerable individuals may become batterers because they're looking for an environment where they can vent their frustration, vent their anger. So individuals who lack economic, social, or personal resources, those who already lack power, right? We saw on the previous slide, people who have economic or political power may be more willing to sort of express their anger, frustration, and violent, violent tendencies, even in pseudo public settings. But if you're somebody who doesn't have a well-paying job, doesn't have political power, um, doesn't necessarily have a lot of community connections or respect, you feel a little bit isolated. And yet you don't have a place to vent your frustration, your anger, but yet in your bubble at home. And there's that old saying, the king of the castle, right? Um, that is the one place where you feel like you have power and you're behind closed doors. And so sadly, even people who on the outset may not look like people who would be in a situation to enforce their aggression or their um, violence actually may take it out on their loved ones in a home situation because that's the only place where they feel like they have the power to vent and they feel like there's a good chance that they won't be seen or detected. And that's always one of the things we want to think about when we're assessing a domestic violence situation. So as we move on to sort of the second of the three sort of family-based areas, we're just going to talk about the general idea of family-based theories in general. So no one specific theory, but I'm just going to recap and touch on a few components that tend to come out of theoretical perspectives in this area. And one of, I think, one of the most important things that I hope you take away from this is what we see here where it says families contain an inherent contradiction. And I imagine almost every one of us who is listening to this right now can think back and remember some sort of conflict within their family that sort of speaks to this inherent contradiction. Whether you have a small close-knit family, whether you have a large close-knit family, or whether you have sort of an estranged family. What happens in a family is we need, there's a, there's a battle going on. Because you are family, you are blood, or you are bound by marriage, or whatever it may be, there is the need and necessity of showing, of nurturing, showing love, supporting family members. You're there for your spouse. You're there for your children. You're there for your sister. You're there for your parents, things of that nature. So there's that nurture, love, and support, but that's not always easy to do day in and day out, right? Right. Because a family, by definition, is also a tight social group. 
And if you imagine, especially right now with a lot of the shutdowns and the COVID stay at home and the quarantine and restrictions, imagine some people have realized what it's like to be stuck with a your tight family group 24 seven, right? All of a sudden when you're together all the time, that can also lead to frustration, anger, conflict, contempt, things of that nature. So this battle that is, goes on within every family, at least to some level, can also become a place that, be, that it is also fertile ground for creating frustration, anger, resentment, things that may bubble over into acts of violence or domestic violence. You know in your mind you need to nurture love and support, but also you may be fed up with how your parents are behaving or your spouse or your sister, etc., and so within this, I want you to keep that in mind, this idea of this inherent contradiction. And especially as we move forward in the course, think about how do we alleviate that within a family? I mean, obviously, when the world is, is calm and things are they're perfect, you would hope that every person in the family has their own hobbies, their own interests, their opportunities to get out, maybe working outside of the home and then leaving work at work and coming back to the home. But in certain situations... That's not always possible for the members of that family. They can't escape the frustration that they have outside and they bring it back home. And then in that environment, that tight social environment, that anger and frustration can bubble over and the victims can be their own family members. And then we have to think about the importance of family structure and societal trends. So what do I mean by this? Okay, so I've hit at a couple of these things, but this is also a key thing about the dynamics of a family in and of itself that can create problematic situations for domestic violence. First, when we think about how the family is structured, well, oftentimes in a, you know, a, a prototypical family, we think of how we assign responsibilities within that family, like who does the cooking? Who does the cleaning? Who brings in the money? Who is the one who sort of makes sure you know, plans outings, things of that na nature? The assignment of responsibilities are often not really based upon one individual's level of competence to do that job. Rather, historically, we base it on age and gender, right? I mean, there's the old stereotypical approach that the man should work and earn the money and the woman should make sure the house is clean, the kids are raised, and the food is on the table. And if we're having a, you know, the man, the only time he's going to cook is when we're having that outdoor barbecue. And the kids, once they reach a certain age, they learn, they're told that their first chores are to make their bed, take out the trash, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you probably have seen this, even if your family is not that sort of historical prototypical structure, then we still see sort of um, vestigial like reminders of this in a lot of families. And this also sort of creates a, a certain amount of resentment and contempt within that family structure in and of itself as far as assuming that one person is supposed to be the breadwinner or is supposed to be the, the home cook or the cleaner, right? As opposed to sharing those responsibilities and also assigning them with, by whoever is the most competent to do them regardless of age or gender or anything of that nature. Now, where does this become even more compounded? We saw in that previous slide that inherent contradiction of the family, right? The need for love, nurturing, supporting family members, but also you're all stuck in a bubble where sort of your anger and frustration and contempt can grow. Well, imagine if all of a sudden you, you're, you and your family move to a new town, a new uh, city, a new state, or imagine if your family is, if you're immigrants to a new country where you don't necessarily know the customs, you may not speak the language well, um, you don't necessarily know the culture, you don't have any close-knit group of friends when you first get there. And that creates social isolation, right? And so within that, all of a sudden, you lose extended family connections. You may not have strong ties to your neighborhood. You may not have church and social groups that you're connected to. All of these things you can imagine all of a sudden that bubble that I referred to earlier becomes an even more thickly walled and more daunting bubble uh, 
Whereas if there is, all it takes is one person in the family who ha is prone towards violence and aggression. If you have that within there, all of a sudden, the, the nastiness, I'll just keep it that way, that can occur within that family's bubble can become even worse. And we see this. We see this, um, unfortunately, when we look at the literature, and we'll talk a little bit more about this on a later slide, but within families that are immigra or immigrants to a new country, they are socially isolated. Um, also, since pretty much, you know, in America, since the end of World War II, there has been a, a growing sort of reliance on what we call the, the sort of the nuclear family, right? People move all around the country for new jobs or, you know, um, it's easy to live, you know, on the other side of the country from your extended uncles and, and parents and grandparents. So your family is socially isolated. And so you don't have these connections. And one of the things that a lot of criminal justice research and especially research about victimization and domestic violence focuses on is, is that when victims lack connections to their neighborhood, to their community, they are on, on an island. They're on a virtual island where their likelihood of victimization just continues to increase. And we're going to see that as a, sadly, we're going to see that as a theme through a lot of these theories and a lot of the applications revolve, or involving domestic violence that we will investigate. We're gonna see the stories of where, you know, a young woman is at home and her husband doesn't want her to work. He kind of helps to fuel the isolate, isolation. Um, or she doesn't have friends or family, she's moved across the country to join him or maybe left her home country to join him in another country. Um, and this, that's just one example using the woman as a victim, but obviously it cuts across gender, it cuts across culture and race. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea of this importance of how when a family may be together as a family, that sounds good, but if there's a sense of social isolation, that may not be such a good thing. Now let's move on to our sort of third family-based areas. And this is taking some ideas from some learning theories. Um, and the idea is like, well, where does somebody, maybe somebody doesn't necessarily have a biological or psychological drive to you know, be prone towards um, aggression and violence. Maybe they learn it. And this is something, once again, you've seen it through a lot of the criminal justice-based learning theories. And two of the key things that I think are really important about learning um, theories are the concept of modeling and the, con the importance of understanding subcultures. Um, and what we see with modeling, if you're unfamiliar with modeling, it's in a simplest sense, is that it's one of our mechanisms for how we learn, right? We have, and you may remember from other classes, you talk about like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, things in which how we learn in this world. But one of the key ways that children learn is by modeling the behavior of others. They see their father behave this way. They th see him in a positive light. They want to be like that. So they act like that. They see their mother behave in a certain way. They respect her. They want to be like that. So, and also not only do they model the behavior, but they also model the definition. And this is a key thing. So you think back to like Sutherland's theory of differential association. The term differential association, the key idea of that was all about the moment in which you sort of, your values about what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, shift. They become differentially associated. And that's kind of one of the key backbones or, or cornerstones to this idea of modeling, is that you children don't just necessarily learn and see certain bad behaviors, but they start to internalize this concept that those behaviors are acceptable. And that's a dangerous combination. And you see there, one of the points I have here says that almost half of male batterers actually witness their own father beating their mother, right? So it is, it's a generational problem. And so one of the things that I want your mind to be thinking about, yes, we should be aware of it. Yes, it may not necessarily be the most, you know, groundbreaking thing to be presenting right now. And you may go, yeah, I could have figured that out. But it's also important for us, and this is what I key takeaway, is one, we don't want, we want to stop this modeling sort of cycle, but also it gives us an opportunity as an intervention, right? If there's ways to work with family, ways to work with children, especially in the schools, in the churches, in sports, in other community groups, where they start to learn that certain behaviors are not acceptable, 
and you kind of get them to bring them back to a better understanding of acceptable versus unacceptable. Um, second sort of learning thing is this notion of sub subculture. Now, subculture theory during the 1950s and 60s was definitely a huge part of criminological research, um, especially examining uh, gang behavior and drug uh, use behavior and this idea of like the, that not a culture isn't just one thing. There are subcultures, groups within the larger culture. And the key thing is, is within these subcultures, values and norms become further reinforced within tight groups, right? If It's one thing if I go to school and my teacher says, you should behave this way and do that. And I go, okay, whatever. And I go to church and my pastor or priest says, you should behave this way and do whatever. I say, sure, whatever. But if the moment that all of a sudden the people that I feel closest with, maybe my, my closest group of friends, if they say, hey, you should behave this way and, and do that, all of a sudden those values and norms are going to become more reinforced to me because they're from my tight group. They're my buddies. You know, they're the ones, the people that I hang with, the people that I run with, and I value their opinions. And that can also become a really dangerous thing for becoming fertile ground for the growth of domestic violence. One way that it does it is it leads to the possibility of intergenerational transmission of family violence, right? Um, it's not just through modeling, but also oftentimes your, your family is a subculture unto itself, especially if you have an extended family, right? And you can think about different cultures where it's not just sort of that, that nuclear family that I referred to in the past with, you know, the mom, the dad, the couple of kids, a dog, a cat, and that's it. No, I mean, there's a lot of families where you've got aunts, uncles, cousins, etc., And that also becomes a subculture unto itself. And so children being raised in an environment where they're seeing their father behave one way and their uncle does the same thing. And then one of their cousins does the same thing. Those values are going to be reinforced within that child. Um, and then one of the things that comes out of this, and so I'm going to slow down for this last part because I think this is something that is, you know, also an interesting thing to make sure you make clear note of it is when you have children being raised where seeing and modeling negative or bad behavior and seeing it become acceptable, when you see this sort of subculture idea where children are growing up and seeing that it's okay to engage in certain activities or to yell at somebody, it's okay to hit somebody if they talk back to you. It's okay to, to demean your wife or your husband or whatever else because everyone else is doing it, right? And subculture, it's not just family. It's not just your best friends. This happens amongst adults, right? It's the guys at work that I go out drinking with and we become a subculture and we talk about things about our wives and our kids and, and I start to learn their values. It's the wives getting together for a glass of wine and, and talking you know, about their kids and their husbands. Those are subcultures too. And when you see this, not just within adults, but within children especially, people in their mind, they start to see relationships as a simple dichotomy. So what do I mean by a dichotomy? It means there's two choices, two sides, that's it. So when a relationship becomes seen as a simple dichotomy, that's dangerous because there should be, any relationship should be dynamic. There's not always the person who makes the money and the person who doesn't. There's not always the person who cleans and the person who doesn't. There's not always a person who brings home and cooks the food and the person who doesn't. That's not healthy, right? We should have fluidity. There should be a dynamic nature where sometimes you step up and you take care of cooking while your partner can relax a little bit. Or you step in to get a job on the side so that your partner doesn't have to work as much, right? There's That's the real world. But... When people see sort of this modeling and subcultural um, issues, we, we start to see children especially developing these dichotomies where they start to think that every relationship has to have a leader and then everyone else is a follower. And you can imagine how the power struggle, you know, goes in one way. Then we have the idea that in relationships, there are the powerful and there are the weak. And the weak are there to be victimized and reminded that they're weak. The followers are there to be reminded that they follow and they have to follow whatever the leader says. There's the victimizer and the victim, right? There's a person who, who um, you know, hands out the punishment and there's a person who takes it. And you can imagine that makes it tough. 
So why it's bad enough that the development of these dichotomies is dangerous, but it adds to another layer when these individuals then exit their family bubble and start to engage more with the larger world, right? Once they break out of that bubble of their family or the bubble of their subculture, their closest, you know, friends or whatever, and they have to go out and, and you know, interact with the real world, the real world makes them nervous. It's not yes, no, white, black, right, wrong. No, the world is fluid. It's dynamic. There's many sides to a story. So we see on this very bottom point that I have at the bottom here, it says more socially acceptable and complex relationships make these children feel fearful and insecure, right? And we know this in our own lives. Oftentimes, if you taking a class and you have a question for the professor and you're like, okay, so is the answer this or that? It's easier in our minds if there is a right answer and a wrong answer, right? If there's, it's a yes, no, right, wrong. That's easier for our brains to sort of conceptualize and process. But when our teacher or our professor comes back to us and says, well, it depends on the situation. You you probably had this in your a moment in your life where you've had a question like this and somebody comes back and says, well, it depends. Immediately, you can almost feel like your brain get hot, like, oh, crap. Now I got to start thinking more because it's not simply right or wrong, yes or no. You're like, I just wanted a simple answer. But the reality is the world is not simple. Relationships are not simple. They are complex. And as we mature, and adjust to society, in order for us to be healthy individuals and have healthy relationships, we have to recognize and accept the complexity. And that's really hard for a lot of people. They want things to be simple. So what happens when things get too complex for these people? They either decide, okay, I'm gonna bring, bring it back to the simple dichotomy. I'm gonna be the leader. I'm gonna be the powerful. I'm gonna be the, the victimizer. And that leads to them becoming aggressive and abusive. Or, those people sometimes will go the opposite direction and internalize it and instead bring it, say, I can't handle this complexity. I'm gonna bring it back to a simple dichotomy and they sort of retreat into becoming the follower. They see themselves as a follower. They see themselves as the weak one. They see themselves as the victim, which leads them down the road to self-isolation, self-harm, and further victimization. So this idea within the importance of how we learn over time and how things that have been around in a lot of theories like modeling and the influence of subcultures is important for domestic violence. But I think this idea of the fear of people trying to see relationships as simple dichotomies is a very powerful thing that we need to understand and continue to look at. So one last thing to sort of wrap up with modeling and subculture all right, so when we look at this, this sort of ties up some of the stuff I said about what happens when we try to sort of view the world in sort of a dichotomy approach. So children who experience domestic violence are at a greater risk for a variety of long-term um, consequences. They're not just at um, risk of becoming, you know, victimizers or abusers like they saw their father doing to their mother or that they saw their mother doing to their father. No, children in these relationships are also just as likely to turn to self-harm. And this is kind of what I wrapped up with on that last slide. Learn to self-harm, find themselves falling into relationships where they are the victim. Um, why? Because that's how the world, that's how they saw the world. They didn't realize that they could actually change that things are fluid, that they are dynamic, and it's not a simple right, wrong, victimize or victim. No, they have need to be able to be helped to realize that they can grow, they can change, they can reinvent themselves, and that's perfectly fine. And you see here I've in red, it says internalizing and externalizing behavioral outcomes. Well, what do I mean by this? And we'll touch on this um, a little bit later in the semester, but one of the things we notice is there's also a breakdown when people are sort of victims or experience domestic or live in a household with domestic violence as a child or as an adolescent, not everyone is going to sort of the behavioral outcomes are not going to be the same for everyone. 
some people are more likely to go sort of do the self-harm approach. That's the internalizing behavioral responses. Things like de depression, substance abuse, um, finding themselves feeling like they are a victim. That's sort of the internalizing outcomes. Other individuals are more likely to display externalizing responses to having been raised in a house of experiencing domestic violence. And externalizing outcomes are things like anger, aggression, um, violence, engaging in violence for no reason at all. So one of these things that I think is important is, and we'll talk more about later, but is understanding the difference between internalizing behavioral outcomes versus externalizing. So just to recap, internalizing is more when people turn the harm onto themselves with depression, self-harm, substance abuse, etc. Externalizing is when they take their, their behavioral responses are to act out against others in an aggressive or violent way. And as we will see, the sad reality is, is that women on average are more likely to internalize these behavioral uh, responses and men are more likely to externalize or you know, engage in externalize, um, externalizing behavioral responses. So, but the good news is, is the more we understand about various learning theories and how individuals from childhood all the way up through adulthood are continually learning, we realize that people can, if we can break that sort of that cycle and break through and get them to realize that there's they're not a victim. They're not. There's no reason for self harm. Or on the other side, they're not some aggressive, you know, um, perpetrator. Rather, if we get them to understand that the world is more complex, this gives us an opportunity for intervention. And it's, we'll talk about different models that have used this as an opportunity to sort of break the cycle of violence, especially when we look at intergenerational domestic violence. So now let's shift focus and talk a little bit about the other side of sociological factors. So the last few slides we had sort of, as I had mentioned earlier, we had focused on sort of the micro level, the bubble of the family, and maybe at most the bubble of the, a tight subculture that you may grow up in. Well, let's take it out to the community. Look at more of the macro level factors and how a community can either have a role in you know, increasing or decreasing the likelihood of domestic violence. Now, one of the limitations, especially about community, that we still need to improve. And I'll say over the last five, 10 years, we're starting to see more research that is addressing some of these shortcomings. But when we look at how, you know, domestic violence as a whole, we think about, well, who have we studied when we look at domestic violence? Um, what are sort of the community characteristics? We noticed a couple common themes. One is historically domestic violence, most of the research is focused on male on female crime. Most of the research has examined middle and upper class individuals. Most of the research has focused on English speaking populations and cultures. And most of the research, especially here in America, has focused on predominantly white populations. So obviously, as we will continue to talk about this class, and we've already glimpsed at it with the idea of needing to respect and understand the notion of cultural competence, the world is not just male on female crime. It's not just a bunch of white middle and upper class people who speak English, right? And so those, if we wanna take and learn about domestic violence and learn about the complexity, not to bring that back to the previous slides, but I might as well, of just how complex relationships are in this world, we need to continue to push for uh, more research that examines other communities, other groups of individuals, and realize that the shoe doesn't always fit the same when we're trying to make it fit in a different situation. Um, coming from a correctional research background, one of the things that um, also, it's only been in the last couple decades that uh, we started to realize is that even in the prison setting, so much about prison management and theories of prison and how we run the correctional system historically was always focused on men and male inmates, male offenders. And one of the things that just in the last few decades that we started to realize is that female offenders are different, right? And so 
trying to design women's prisons and women's jails and the policies and the programs and even the type of food, the type of exercise and education, the type of, of clothing that is issued to these, these inmates doesn't necessarily work. We can't just make, you know, have a bunch of women go into a male design, a prison design for men. And we started to realize that there's nuances in order to, if we want to help people get them to stop committing crime, we need to pay attention to that particular group, that particular culture. The same thing is, is the case with examining and understanding the causes and correlates of domestic violence and trying to find avenues in which we can get in there and stop um, the spread or the increasing or just the continuation of domestic violence. We want to find ways to curb it, to stop it. Um, so we need to understand all the nuances of different cultures. So similar to what I did with family um, and, and theory, I'm going to do the same thing with community. I'm not necessarily going to focus on any particular um, community-based or macro-level sociological theories. Rather, I'm going to highlight sort of three important um, community-level factors that, that sort of, you know, um, seem to keep popping up in the literature about domestic violence. So the first is the role that economic d disadvantage and or financial strain can play um, in the realm of domestic violence. Now, this probably doesn't come as much of a surprise to a lot of us, but we see it over and over again, a very strong correlation between unemployment and domestic violence, particularly domestic homicide, right? People get laid off and all of a sudden their sense of power um, is lost, especially if that individual was the quote unquote breadwinner for the family who was bringing home the money. All of a sudden their sort of power, the one, you know, the one, you know, key card that they had in their deck has been stripped away from them. And so their outlets for anger and aggression, their, their sense of purpose, their sense of power has disappeared. And therefore this can lead to a lot of negative responses within their, their family situation. Um, and especially amongst men, we see this, and this goes back to what we've talked about, sort of like the, the gender roles, like when we, when relationships and groups focus way too much on sort of the historical gender-based roles about who should be what, that can be a really damaging thing. Um, and we see it when we look at the numbers that when men are laid off, the levels of domestic violence go up quite a bit. We don't see those same numbers when women lose their jobs in a relationship. And then this is what I was also just sort of touching on is the, the importance of understanding traditional gender roles. So, and you may think, well, the gender roles, isn't that just within the family? Not really. This is much more of a macro thing because usually as you're raised and the community, the larger community that you grew up in, the role, the gender roles tend to be a community sort of level um, variable or, or a construct. And we see that in relationships that promote um, the quote unquote traditional gender roles. And what I mean by that is the women are there to raise children, stay at home, cook and clean. The men are the ones to go out and make money, um, to do the heavy lifting as far as, you know, the manly work or whatever you want to call it. Um, when we see various cultures and communities that sort of still rely on those traditional gender roles, we tend to see that highly correlated with domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Um, and then also, when we see within those traditional gender roles, we also see that when there's too much pride put into sort of the masculine identity, um, then that also tends to be sort of um, another correlate of higher levels of domestic violence. Um, and it's one of those things where you can imagine, it's like, you know, for a community where it's all about having that masculinity, and if masculinity is tied in with having a job, having strength, you know, fighting, making sure no other men invade your household, things of that nature. You can imagine how all those become sort of fertile grounds for domestic violence to sort of to grow and prosper. And that's not something we want to have. And then finally, as we wrap this one up, we think about another factor that's increased with um, likelihood of violence at the community level, and that's social, isola social isolation. Um, so this is another one. You've heard me mention social isolation, um, and it comes in many ways and shapes and forms. 
And this is going to be another one of those key terms or key phrases I want you to make note of as we continue on in this course, because you're going to see it popping up in videos and readings um, and theory and other things we're going to talk about nonstop. And so oftentimes people think of, well, social isolation, we think of, you know, immigrant populations. You're new to a country or new to an area. Maybe you don't speak the, you don't speak the language very well. And so in America, we see that we tend to see higher levels of domestic violence in some of these immigrant populations, especially when they're non-English speaking. But social, isol social isolation, don't just allow yourself to think, oh, it's only about immigrants. No, it's not. Social isolation occurs in so many ways, shapes, and form nowadays, right? We talked about the idea of sort of an increasing uh, approach, especially in American culture, to move away from our family, move away from our parents, move away from the towns that we grew up in to marry somebody or cohabitate with somebody and start a life in another country or on the other side of the same country or in another state. That is still a form of social isolation. And if you then combine that with something we'll talk about in our next lecture, which is coercive control, if one person starts to see themselves as the powerful and you as the follower, see, think back to that, that those social or those um, dichotomies that we saw several slides ago and how all these things start to work together. When you start to combine social isolation with a then mix in a relationship where one of the people feels like they are the leader, therefore their partner must be the follower. All of a sudden that leader starts to choose and can sort of pick and pick the friends that the quote unquote follower gets to have. They get to pick when and where the quote unquote follower goes out and, and interacts with the community or if they go to church or if they go to other sort of social gatherings, right? And this can increase the level of social isolation, and it also also helps to increase sort of that dichotomy of the leader follower example. Um, so all these things we we can see the dangers of these things, and then obviously another thing that sort of ties into social isolation is we see that the likelihood of domestic violence increases when we have when it's coupled with economic strain, immigration status, and fear of authorities. Right, so. Social isolation, social isolation, wish I could say that correctly, um, is bad enough, but when we start to see it combined with all sorts of these other things, it can make the fire burn even hotter, so to speak. Um, and that leads to a further social isolation, further power being given to the abuser, further um, harm being done to the victim. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up there. We've gone a little bit longer on this um, this lecture, but this wraps up the second part of our three theory lectures. We will dive into the third part with our next lecture um, and examine the, the pivotal roles that research and theoretical understandings of, of the role that substance abuse can play um, in the realm of domestic violence, as well as what I've alluded to a couple times, uh, a growing area of research and theoretical application um, that deals with a concept called coercive control. So until next time, I will See you then and have a good day.